I'm gonna share for you a message uh, that call, is called Loving Your Enemies. Has anybody here got an enemy? <laughs> One brave person put their hand up. Okay, praise God. Is anybody an enemy to somebody? <laughs> I am an enemy to the devil. I can tell you that right now. Anybody else? Arr, yes, praise God. Loving your enemies or loving those who come against you. Now, uh, not that this is a part of my sermon, but there's a great book I just read this last week. And it's actually called uh, uh, Forgiving What You Can't Forget. Uh, but name, sister's name is Lisa, uh, typical American, they spell Lisa with a Y instead of an I. They always spell things differently, okay? But uh, Turkerist, I think the name is, Lisa Turkerist, okay? This is a brilliant book on uh, forgiveness, forgiving what you can't forget. And if you have a battle of being able to forget certain things and, and forgiveness, this is a great book. I read this book, loved it immensely. Many good quotes in this area that I just love so much. Um, for example, we see only what the human mind can imagine, but God is building something we cannot even fathom. And there's just great statements of encouragement here. And I said to Danny, because Danny, they set up the little bit of bookstore in there. I said, get a bunch of these, you know what I mean? And uh, if you're wanting some, we've got them available at the back. <laughs> only two left, three left. Okay, so they're gone like hotcakes already from the ever service, so there's three left. So if you wanted to get one of the books, you can't have this, it's my book, okay? And I don't lend my books, okay? So uh, you know why I don't lend my books? Because they don't come back, okay? So uh, that's why I don't lend them, all right? So <laughs> that's what happens, praise God. But we have a few there, and if, you, if we sell out, you can already order it, and we'll order it in for you, and I like to recommend books every so often. 1 Samuel 24, verse 1. Now, when Saul returned from pursuing the Philistines, which was his God-ordained mission, was to push out the Philistines out of the promised land, it was reported to him saying, Behold, David is in the wilderness of En Gedi. Then Saul took 3,000 chosen men from all of Israel and went to search for David and his men in front of the rocks of the mountain goats. And he came to the sheepfolds on the way where there was a cave, verse three, and Saul went in to relieve himself, as you do, I suppose. Now David and his men were sitting in the inner recesses of the cave. It must have been one big cave. David had 600 men and who knows who else was involved, their wives or whatever else, I don't know, but it must have been a big cave. And after Saul came in to relieve himself, verse four, David's men said to him, behold, this is the day of which the Lord said to you, behold, I'm about to hand your enemy over to you and you shall do to him as it seems good to you. Then David got up and cut off the edge of Saul's robe secretly. There are always well-meaning believers who are around you that want to try and kind of quote scriptures to do things that you shouldn't do. Hmm. There are always well-meaning Christians who want to quote to you scriptures, try to convince you to do things that you just should not do. And it's a tragedy when we listen to this. And David rebuked his men with these words. What words? He said this in verse six. Far be it from me because of the Lord that I would do this thing to my Lord, the Lord's anointed, to reach out with my hand against him since he is the Lord's anointed. So David rebuked his men and Saul got up and left the cave. There are certain Christians that hate this message about God's anointed. I've read so many times about how Christians on their media hate it when they're attacking a pastor or a leader and they say, don't touch God's anointed. And they come up with all this trash talk. They're not anointed. They're not a God. They're not a... If anybody seemed ungodly, it had to be Saul. And just to make it even more known, even the man of God said, God has left you Saul. But David still recognized that what God had appointed, it is up to God to remove. Now, every single person who was born of God is anointed of God. That means your spouse. It means your children. It means your parents. It means you. It means me. And the Word of God says, don't touch your anointed. Don't you talk about your spouse the way you do. That is God's anointed. Don't you talk about your parents the way you do. That is God's anointed. Don't talk about your pastor or your parishioners. That is God's anointed. 
And many of us wonder why things happen the way they do. And it happens because we are not conscious of the anointing of God. Well-meaning men, well-meaning people wanted to convince David that he needed to take matters into his own hands. Well-meaning. I have known pastors who have come to me in years gone by who wept in front of me and said, Pastor, there are Christians in my fellowship who are telling me to do things that I know I should not do. Pray for me. I said, just the very idea that I have to pray for you is the idea that you are entertaining those thoughts. You should have rebuked them. Three years later, they did exactly what those persons did, asked them to do. They promised him money. If you will do this, we will tithe to you. If you will do that, we will go here. And they did it. And 10, 15 years later, what has it done for them? Nothing. Nothing. In fact, the very ones who made the promises left them. There is a principle here, there is a policy here that God's word gives. When you interpret the Old Testament, you need to understand that there are certain things that apply to us and other things that don't. For example, ceremonial laws do not apply to you. Ceremonial laws about being clean, about what you eat, and not mixing the cotton with other fragments and so on and so forth. There are ceremonial laws of uncleanness. They no longer relate to us because we now have Jesus. Then there are laws about days and Sabbaths and everything else. They also don't belong to us because that had to do with the temple. And the temple tent was torn. These things no longer work as jurisdiction over us. And if there are persons teaching you that, they are not teaching you the truth. They are in error. Error. But there are principles that are relative. Like the old says, they should not kill. They should not commit adultery. They should not lust. These things are moral laws that come from the Old Testament that are still paramount. We have this problem with not understanding the Bible, so we make things up. For example, in Proverbs 22, verse 6 or 16, I think it is, and it says, Train your child in the ways of the Lord, and when they grow old, they'll not fall from it. And we claim it as a promise. Look, I'm going to shatter it, this for you. It is not a biblical promise. Proverbs is called a book of wisdom literature. And when you read that text of Scripture, train your child in the ways of the Lord, it is not a biblical promise that if you raise your child in the ways of God, they'll never fall, but rather it is a proverb, it is a statement of wisdom. It's the same thing as look before you leap. It's wisdom. Look before you leap. But if it means I looked and I leaped and I still broke my ankle, does that then mean that the promise is broken? No, it's just a, a, a wisdom. And Proverbs, think of the word Proverbs, is a book of wisdom. But Christians will take Proverbs 22, train your child in the ways of the Lord, take it as a promise. You need to do a bit of an exegesis. You need to come to Bible school. We've got one, we'll help you. So many parents have come under condemnation and damnation because they've raised their children, yet they walked away from God as if somehow a biblical promise was broken. It is not a promise. It is wisdom literature. That's what it's about. And we as Christians have got this terrible, terrible hankling to try and take things and twist it to how we think it's appropriate to us. But when it comes to a scripture like this, do not touch God's anointed, we leave it behind. I don't like that one. Why? Well, I like to criticize. I like to attack leadership. I like to attack my spouse. I like to attack my children. I like to attack my parents. I like to attack another brother or sister in law. I like to attack them. I don't like that one. Listen, friends. 
The word of God that we should be concerned about is the word of God that we don't bother with. The word of God that we should be concerned about is the word of God we don't. If I notice anything the last few years, I've seen how vulgar, crude, rude, demeaning Christians have been on the electronic media with what they say about pastors and others. Even right now, I see it. I see it. Prominent people who aren't pastors but claim to be pastors and they are pastors by being recognized by other pastors, not by a self-appointed person saying, I'm a pastor. If no other pastors or group will recognize you pastor, I've got news for you, you ain't a pastor. I don't care what you say. So David calls out to Saul, verse 11, he says, so my father, look, indeed, look at the edge of your robe on my hand, for by the fact that I cut off the edge of your robe but did not kill you, no one understand that there is no evil or rebellion in my hands and I have not sinned against you, though you are lying in wait for my life to take it. David is not talking to somebody who's a stranger. David's not talking to someone who's an enemy called the Philistines. David's not talking about somebody who served him on the army. He's talking to a man whom he saw as a father. Saul, he says, Father, I could have killed you. Father, but I did not. Verse 12, may the Lord judge between you and me. This is what Saul says. And may the Lord take vengeance on you for me, but my hand, I'm sorry, David said, but my hand shall not be against you. As the proverb of the ancient says, out of the wicked comes wickedness, but my hand shall not be against you. David is saying here, just because you are wicked doesn't give me a right to respond. Just because you are wicked doesn't mean I go down to your level. Verse 15, may the Lord therefore be judge and decide between you and me and may he see and plead my cause and save me from your hand. And when David had finished speaking these words to Saul, Saul said, is this your voice, my son David? See, there is a, almost a paternal relationship here. It's not only that David sees Saul as a father figurehead, but Saul sees David as a son. Verse 17, and Saul says to David, you are more righteous than I, for you have dealt with me while I have still dealt maliciously with you. You have declared today that you have done good to me and that the Lord handed me over to you, yet you did not kill me. Though if a man finds his enemy, will he let him go away unharmed? Saul is perplexed. Saul knew God's anointing. Saul knew God, yet Saul behaved in a way that was not of God. And Saul says, wouldn't somebody, if the enemy was given him, giving to them, finish them up? Yet you would not. Because David realized there's a principle higher than the emotion. There's a principle higher than your hurt. There's a principle higher than your memory. There's a principle higher than the threat. It's the principle of God and His Word. May the Lord therefore reward you with good and return for what you've done to me this day. Now behold, I know that you will certainly be king and that the kingdom of Israel will be established in your hand. Verse 21. So now swear to me by the Lord that you will not cut off my descendants after me and that you will not eliminate my name from my father's household. And David swore an oath to Saul. Verse 22. Then Saul went to his home, but David and his men went up to the stronghold. God had a purpose of blessing. God has a purpose of destiny for David. But at this point in David's life, he's being put through what I call the crucible of testing. It was to determine David's fitness for what God had planned for him. Many times we say, God, use me. But God says, let's see how you go through the fitness test. Let's see how you go through the fitness test. The minute that God begins to give you dreams about what you can be, a test comes. When Joseph had the dream of greatness, the test came. When the blessings come, the test comes. When Daniel was promoted, the test came. David was now at the point of greater danger than he had ever experienced before with Saul. David with his 600 men versus Saul and his 3,000. 
Now remember, Saul's 3,000 were hand-picked warriors from his huge army. But David's men were 600 wannabes who turned up at the cave of Adullam. They were broken. They were just hurt, disoriented, disillusioned. And they came to David versus Saul who picked the best of his army. And they would go to a place called En Gedi, which means the haunt of a wild goat. Now I know En Gedi, I've been there, I've seen it. It's a mountainous area southwest of the Dead Sea and there's many caves and great rocks. And there David was sheltered. And here's David with his 3,000 men handpicked, hunting for David with his 600 disillusioned men. And David's hiding in a cave. And Saul's men march by, then Saul comes in. And as Saul enters the darkness of the cave, he could see nothing. He was completely unaware of the presence of David and his men. Breathlessly, his men must have waited. I try to imagine how David's men felt when all David did was cut off a corner of Saul's robe. This is the great warrior they'd heard about. This is the man they sang songs about that Saul had killed his thousands, but David his 10,000s. And yet here is David having the opportunity to get rid of his enemy, not only for David's sake, but for his 600 men's sake. They would no longer be pursued. Maybe they think that he choked. Maybe they think that he was too emotional. Maybe they think that he had lost his cutting edge. David says to his men in 1 Samuel 24, 6, far be it from me because of the Lord that I would do this thing to my Lord, the Lord's anointed, that I would reach out with my hand against him since he is a Lord anointed. You see, so many times, We allow our emotions to control us rather than us control our emotions. And by David's statement, he was saying, I will not permit my emotions to control me. My emotions will not dictate my destiny, nor will I allow the emotions of my men dictate to me my future. Verse seven of 1 Samuel 24 says, so David rebuked his men. And he did not allow them to rise up against Saul. So Saul got up and left. And when Saul got up and left, the Bible says, David ran out to the clearing and he confronted him with the evidence of his mercy. His men are going like, why? We don't understand you. When a man or a woman follows God's word, it's not just you that doesn't understand them, they don't understand themselves. When I've taken certain paths or certain choices, several years back, I was making certain choices about certain situations and I felt God said, just leave it alone. Now, my wife and my son got so concerned about me that they decided to talk to me like, am I okay? I said, I am. Then why are you acting different? And I said, if I'm confusing you, don't worry, God's confusing me as well. Because what I'm doing is not what I wanna do, but what I'm doing is what I know I have to do. Why? Because I don't wanna touch God's anointed. And God's anointed is not how you judge it. It's not how you determine it. You might not think I'm God's anointed. You might not think the person next to you is God's anointed. You might not think your spouse is God's anointed. You might not think your children are God's anointed. You might not think your parents are God's anointed. You might not think your previous church is God's anointed. Why is it that when someone leaves the church, they think they take the anointing with them? I have left and the anointing has come with me. Excuse me, inverted commas, stupid. Well, Brian Houston, well, he's not anointed. 
This person, well, he's not anointed. My previous pastor, he's not anointed. If David could say that Saul was anointed and Saul was a murderer, all those priests he had executed, he lost the call of God. Yet David said, far be it from me to touch God's anointed. He's talking about in this house. Well, he killed the enemy, the Philistines. That wasn't God's anointed. God's anointed, he's talking about God's people, God's chosen people. He's talking about other believers. Doesn't mean we're going to attack and kill the unsaved, but you get my point, maybe. But there's another illustration. In 1 Samuel 26, Saul was still pursuing David. One minute, Saul's saying, I'm not going to touch you. I, I see God's hand in you. I bless you, bless my family. Then all of a sudden, this evil spirit comes on Saul again. He's after David again. He's going to kill him. And Saul and his men are sleeping in the valley. 3,000. His general, Abner, is beside him. And David grabs one of his key men, Abishai, the brother of Joab. These three boys are just a headache, I tell you. Just a headache. They always want to kill someone. You always have someone in the family who wants to kill someone. You know what I mean? I don't mean literally, but someone that says, let's just get rid of them. The Bible says that David of Abishai come down to where Saul's sleeping, go past his bodyguard to get right in there. And they take the sword, the spear, and they take the water bottle. And Abishai says in 1 Samuel 26 verse 8, he says to David, God has delivered your enemy into your hand again. And then he says this, if you were squeamish, now I use this, I bring this out here, he says, if you're screamish because they might think the reason why David didn't take care of Saul in the cave is maybe he's a bit screamish. And that says, if you were screamish, I'll kill him for you. There's always someone out there who wants to do it for you. There's always someone out there who wants to make you look like you're not involved, but they do it and you know they're involved. It's like in psychology, you know what I mean? We talk about psychology in certain aspects. We talk about the different personalities. And there's one particular group we talk about the phlegmatic person, you know what I mean? You've got the cleric who's just like in your face and like, this is what I think, man. Stop looking at me, okay? You've got the melancholy that's always in the details. You've got the sanguine that's, I'm the party, I'm the life, don't say anything, okay? Then you've got the phlegmatic, you know what I mean? The, the phlegmatic is like, you've got this line of people, right? And you've been standing in line for a while and the phlegmatic's there, right? And somebody cuts the line. Now the phlegmatic's not gonna confront them because they're not confrontational. But they'll speak loud enough to find a choleric in the line, right? So the person's cut in and the phlegmatic go, I wish somebody would do something about that. I wish somebody had the courage to go and tell the person you'll be there. I wish, and the choleric's going, <laughs> They hadn't even noticed it, but and all of a sudden they go like, hey, you! The flag man's go, oh my goodness, how did that happen? How did that come about? And again, David said to him, I will not destroy you, though I have the power to do it. His men are wondering, what on earth is happening to this guy? What is happening to our leader? He doesn't seem to be functioning the way that we want. You know, if David had killed Saul, he would have removed God from the picture. He would have removed God from the picture. I met up with a pastor this week, the elder pastors, older. And I was having fellowship with them, just communicating with them and sharing. And, and they're later in life. And I've known them since I was like 14, 15. And they're same brackets as my mom in the 80s. And I was just talking about people and family and how things are. And uh, they're talking about a family member, a young lady, a lady. And, uh, and I was asking how the kids are going for the Lord and they've got several of them are serving as pastors. And they talked about uh, this one daughter and they said uh, she's, she wants, she's got nothing to do with church anymore. She's, she's not in the house of God. 
and I could see just the enormous pain and the tears and remember the area there when they said that. And I said, oh, that's too bad, I'll pray. They said, well, the issue is her husband. The, the husband is just got caught up in some doctrines and things and is totally anti-God and has even banned her from having fellowship with the parents. And I said, but they're still together. He said, oh, don't, don't be fooled. He has told her to pack up and get out. He has told her, you pack up and get out. And I said, what'd she say? She says, this is my home. This is my marriage. These are my kids. This is my destiny. And you don't have the final word. <laughs> now she's going for hell. But she ain't bitter at God. She ain't bitter at parents. And she ain't bitter at her husband. But she says, you don't have the final word. God does. Amen. Well, that's made him angrier than you could ever imagine. But she don't care. She said, I said I do. And this is what I do. Now, you don't know her. And I'd never disclose her to you. And you'd never meet her. But these are the heroes of the faith. It's not some guy in a pulpit. It's not some guy in a red suit. It's these sort of people who have this ability to say, I'll hold my mouth. I won't touch God's anointed. This is how it's done. Now, I'm not putting condemnation on anybody else who's done other things. I'm just telling you how it's working in this particular section of the world. If David had slain Saul, he would have removed God out of the picture. See, that's what happened. That's what happened to, to, to Abraham and that's what happened to Sarah is that in the promise, they, had to, they took the matter out of their own hands. And they brought in a servant girl thinking that this is part of God's solution. You see, how easy it is to take the initiative and how hard it is to wait on God. You hear me? If you're gonna write something down, this is a good thing to write down. How easy it is to take the initiative and how hard it is to wait for God. In Exodus chapter 14, verse 13, I love this scripture. I just love it. The Lord spoke to the children of Israel. They got the Red Sea on one side, Shane, and they got the Egyptian army on the other. It just looks like death or drown. In Exodus 14, 13, this is what the Lord says. He said, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. I love that. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. So what did God do? God did the impossible, right Shane? He parted the water. And what happened to the Egyptian army? God judged them. The waters fell in on them. They waited on God. God opened the door. Then God closed the door. That's what happens. When you read 2 Samuel, when David was king, and we get into around chapter 16, you read about how David is usurped or betrayed by his son Absalom. And his son Absalom rises up and he says, I will be king. And so he decides to be king, he needs to kill his dad. So David and his trusted men get word and they flee. They, they run out of Jerusalem because I know if they stay, they're dead. Now, I know you're gonna say, well, you know, David brought this upon himself. I, I have no doubt that David is reaping what he'd sown. I don't doubt that. But the fact of the matter is, I don't wanna be a part of touching God's anointed. Hello. I don't wanna be a part of touching God's anointed. You know, someone was angry against you, did bad things against you. Then you hear three years later, they separate or divorce. You don't go on saying, well, that's what happens. That's what happens. Or you hear about someone got cancer. You go, well, they touched God's anointed. This is what happened. You, you don't do that. That's demonic. That's demonic. The Bible says you bless your enemies. You pray over your enemies. You love them. When people are hurt, you reach out. I remember when we came to, to, to plant our church and, and two, three months before, in the February before we came, which was June, we came, I went to the pastor of the area where I used to be working at and I went to him to ask permission, say permission, 
I asked permission if I could come back and plant a church. Now, I'd been out of the country for three years, but I asked permission. He was never my pastor. He was the pastor who took over from my pastor. And in those days, in the denomination, I used to be in what was called the Assemblies of God, there was a clause we had that you couldn't put another church within five kilometers of the other one. Today, you could be next door. So I came back and asked because we had nothing. I didn't even have a car, but we we're gonna start in our home, which was in uh, Eight Mile Plains, and it was four and a half Ks from the church. And I knew that because I drove to measure it. And because it was four and a half Ks, I had to ask for permission, if I may. And I said, just three months, and then we'll move out. So that pastor celebrated me and said, you can. And he said, come to our Southeast District Pastors Government, about 100 pastors, and we'll celebrate you coming back. So we did, we went there and they celebrated, announced us back. So we went home, prepared things, and in three months we came back. And we came back in June. And that first Sunday, I went to that church because we came back here on a Wednesday or Thursday. That first I went to that church to say, hey, just let you know we're here and we're starting next Sunday. We want to be the area. And that pastor was good to me, but he said this, you go ahead and start the church, but... We're not gonna cover you. We're not gonna support you. We're not gonna help you. I said, that's okay. That's okay. That's okay. I'm not asking for it, but I just wanna be accountable to you. Three months later, that pastor now hated us. So much so that in transferring of my credentials back, he blocked it. I rang out the state supervisor and I said, hey, what's happening? He said, well, this pastor has put a block on you with his seniority. So I said, how do I work this out? He says, unless he releases it, we can't help you. I asked that pastor, could I see him? He says, I don't want to see you. So I wrote him a letter. I said, look, bro, I repent. Whatever you want me to do, I'll put it right. He wrote me a letter back. He said, well, I hope your apology was in the right attitude. He says, I wish you all the best, but I want nothing to do with you. I was like, how do you get reconciliation if the person won't even try? And when you tr apply to the hierarchy, it doesn't happen. So Trevor Chandler reached out to me and he said, uh, hey, uh, uh, why don't you come and be part of our group? And I said, well, I'm blacklisted by the IOG. So you need to ask them because we have an agreement. At that point, we had an agreement that if you're blacklisted in one particular denomination, you can't jump to another. That's how it was. So while I was there in his office, he rang up uh, uh, this particular pastor in the area. He says, uh, Pastor Sean's here to come across. I invite him. Do you have any problems? He said, he's a good man. Take him. <laughs> so we did. Three months after that, that pastor was removed from the ministry under a, a sin six situation. Cast out, thrown out. You know what Sandra and I did? We rang him up and said, can we take you out for lunch? Now, this sin situation happened years before, like a decade before. He said, okay. And we went out for lunch and we ate our meal. And then Sandra and I said, I know you left quickly and they don't wanna honor you and you have no vehicle this time. Here's some money that we put together for you. And we wanna tell you we love you. We don't condone what happened, but we wanna tell you we love you, why? Because that person was still God's anointed. And it's God's hand at work to judge. And God was judging. But if I got involved in the judging, then redemption wouldn't be at work. And we saw it. Now, in all of a sudden, this packed restaurant, this man, this pastor, older pastor, cried so loud. You asked my wife, he cried so loud, even I was embarrassed. <laughs> I said, are you okay? He said, I thought you're gonna rip into me for what I did. I said, no, bro, no. If you need a place to go to church, you're welcome at our house. He stayed in our church for probably 12 months. And then he opened up a church two kilometers away from us. <laughs> I said, go ahead, brother, do what you want. And I got a bunch of you people who want to come with me. I said, go ahead, they're not mine, just go. Do what you want. He's dead now. Well, 
That didn't come out right. <laughs> Don't take it the way I said that. All right. I didn't mean it like that, okay? <laughs> I apologize. It came out wrong. <laughs> it was a long time afterwards. <laughs> that did completely wreck my message, okay? <laughs> But we took the principle of showing God's love in the area. Time's gone. If you want to hear the whole message, you got to, well, you can't because I didn't record it at the eight, did I? So no, well, you can't hear it. So it doesn't matter. You can take this away. <laughs> if you're at the eight and you're watching it, hey, it's a whole new message from here on. No, I didn't mean it like that. Seriously, I didn't. It came out wrong. I just meant he's passed away, so I'm not hurting him in any way by sharing this story, okay? But I'm trying to tell you, there are moments in your life where you're a victim, but you need to understand that even victims sin. You might have been a victim of abuse, but you're sinning in how you talk. You might have been the victim of unfair gossip, but you're sinning in how you handle that and respond to it. See, that's why God said in Exodus, He says, be still and let me, God, be your salvation. Let me bring about the victory. So even when He went out and said, well, I'm taking a bunch of people, I'm going to start the church. I said, whatever, go do it. I love you, brother. It didn't go anywhere. I didn't have to raise my hand. I didn't have to do anything. It didn't go anywhere. It didn't go anywhere. I had one brother I loved, he was a close friend and, and the church was only two years old. It was all this joy was around. You know, people were running on the floor laughing and barking like a dog and everything else, okay? And uh, I know you can't figure what it is, but it was a big thing. And because I didn't roll on the floor and bark like a dog, this other guy said that I wasn't spiritual enough. You know what I mean? Woof, woof, okay? And uh, so he took a group of people. And, uh, you know, it, it happened, you know what I mean? Good man, I still love him dearly, but it happened. You know what I mean? And uh, I was hurt. And uh, I remember praying and I said this. I said, uh, Lord, don't let me bump into him right now because, you know, I wasn't going to hit him. Don't, those days are gone. You know what I'm trying to say? I wasn't going to hit him. But what I mean is I don't want to verbally say something. Does that make sense? So I said, God, don't let me bump into him. So every day I prayed for six weeks, seven days a week. That's 42 days. I prayed. On the 43rd day, Alan, I finished my devotions and I said, I didn't pray for that person. Huh, wacky dude. I didn't have any feeling. That day, Alan, I bumped into him in a, in a shopping center. That day. On the 43rd day, I bumped into him. And when I saw him, I said, hey. Well, he looked at me a little white as sheet, like, oh my goodness, this is the day I was dreading. I ran up and I hugged him. I said, I love you, brother. And you know what he said? I love you too. And we went and had a coffee together. Because you know what? It wasn't needing that person to say sorry. It wasn't needing that person or anything else. It was me needing to deal with it at the cross. And because I had dealt, now it took me 42 days, but the fact is dealing at the cross when I saw that person, I had no other feeling but love. If I bumped into that guy today, when we dedicated this building way back, I invited him along and he came. You see, this, this is what the body of Christ is all about. Is we're meant to be different and God's, is he God's anointed? Yes, sir, he is. Even at that point, yes, sir, he is God's anointed. Was that other pastor who, who, Catch me out and Yes, sir, he is. He said he was. So was I. Because I'm not the one who gets to judge it. God does. I praise the Lord you're not on the throne because you probably wouldn't let me in. But don't worry. If I was on the throne, I might not let you in either. So it don't matter. But praise God that we're not on the throne, but he is. But I know this. If I don't forgive, then it's not just me who gets hindered. It's my wife, it's my family, it's the body of Christ. And many of you men, because of offense, are a stumbling block to your family. Many of you wives, because you won't forgive, you're a stumbling block to your children. 
You've got to learn to forgive and let go. And you've got to learn how to read the Bible correctly. Not subjectively. You've got to know the Word and know how to handle the Word. Otherwise you get carried away with all kind of doctrines. And there's too many weirdos in this place. Not this church, but in general. I'm doing it again. Oh, twice. Oh, I don't mean here, but... Oh, stop it. Let's pray, okay? Let's just pray. <laughs> Oh man, I wish I recorded the first sermon. All right. Father, we, <laughs> we come to you in the only name that we know that really saves, it's Jesus. I come in the name of the Lord who doesn't judge us, but He loves us. While we can feel the conviction, we're okay. But when we no longer feel conviction, we've lost eternity. As long as there's that prick in our heart to not say those words, as long as there's a prick in our heart to say forgive, as long as there's a prick in our heart to do this, we're okay. But when we no longer feel it, when we just do things we want, we have lost eternity. Cover us in the blood. I know people hurt. I know people bleed. I know people, Lord, are disillusioned. I know people, Almighty God, are, are, are just carrying shame and guilt. Lord, let the love of Jesus grab them. It doesn't matter if you're divorced or single or whatever it is that God loves you and we love you and we celebrate you and we're gonna walk with you. Because this is what the love of Jesus does. You're anointed and I'm anointed. He's anointed and she's anointed. You're anointed and over there is anointed. Let's not touch God's anointed. If there are areas that God needs to deal with, then let God deal with it. If you're not born again or you're away from the Lord, you say, Sean, my life is not right with God. If you don't know Jesus or, you, or you're away from Him or you need assurance, would you raise your hand right now and say, Sean, pray for me, I need the Lord. If you're not born again or you're away from the Lord, if you're uncertain of salvation, you need to come back to the Lord, raise your hand, put it up. You can feel the Holy Ghost speaking to you. You can feel the Holy Ghost pulling at your heart. But you've got to respond. You've got to say, I want the Lord. I need Jesus. Don't take the chance of leaving this place not knowing Him. Come to the Lord. Come to the Lord. Come. Those online, if you don't know the Lord, then pray this prayer for me here right now. Say, Jesus, I invite you to come into my heart and my life right now. I repent of all my sins and all my wrongs. I declare today that through the confession of my mouth, through the belief of my heart, Jesus has forgiven me and I am saved. And there's a little pop-up that comes to that screen. If you just fill it in and send it to us, I'll correspond with you. Lord, I bless each one in this family. Over every hurt, over every pain, I speak healing. Lord, let Your Holy Ghost be like a healing balm. And Lord, if right now we just want to tear someone apart, let us just be still. Let us just be still. And let God's healing be at work like a healing balm, I pray. And all God's people said, Amen, Amen, Amen.